When we first introduced predicate logic, we mentioned two things that we were going to defer until we hit multiplace predicate logic. The first of those is operations. So remember, operation letters are lowercase a through h that have a superscript, and these operations represent subjects. So what is an operation? Let's look. What we often use in English are called complex particular terms. Complex particular terms allow us to name a particular individual without actually invoking or using the name itself. And so we often use this when it's actually more informative to give some sort of relational name, or sometimes we just don't actually know the name at all. So I can say Joe's brother's wife, and that does pick out an individual, and I've named that individual even though I haven't used their name. Same thing with Sarah's aunt, or David's cousin's dog's vet, etc. And in order to capture this logically, we use operations. So operations actually work very straightforward. They're sort of like little mini predicates, and we use almost all the same rules as predicates for operations, except we still use lowercase letters a through h because that helps us remember that they are actually the names of an individual or a subject or a term. So how do I symbolize Tom is Canadian? Well, Tom is Canadian is just standard single place predicate logic where the letter E is the name for Tom, so we get F-E. What about symbolizing Tom's cousin? Well, Tom's cousin is just a name, and here we can see from the symbolization scheme that the way to make sense of it is A of E. Now notice there is an important difference here. In predicates, we would never use a bracket around a, a single entry, a single slot. We only use brackets for multiple place predicates. But in operations, we always use brackets whenever there's an entry into the operation, and that's to avoid ambiguous cases. So finally, how can I say Tom's cousin is Canadian? Well, I just need to remember that what goes into a predicate is a subject, an individual, a term. So I can put in A bracket E bracket, and that says Tom's cousin is Canadian. Now don't be deceived, I only put one term into my predicate F, because F is a one slot predicate, and that term just happens to be the operation Tom's cousin. What about the father of Jody, Jody's dog walker's cousin is Canadian? Well here, this is a much more complicated uh, term, and we use a series of operations to identify father of Jody's dog walker's cousin. And there's no sort of trick to this. Uh, you can either work inside out or outside in. Both ways work just fine. So in this example, I'm going to work inside out. So the first easiest sort of relation to capture is Jody's dog walker. Okay, no problem. Now I need to say the cousin of Jody's dog walker, which is A bracket C bracket F bracket. Now notice that I've put in an operation into another operation, and that's okay because each individual successful completed operation is just a singular term in itself. So Jody's dog walker is just one individual, and that person went into the operation cousin. And then the final operation is the father of this person. So in the end, I have the father of the cousin of Jody's dog walker, and that's how you can read this operation. Now to finish this, I just need to say is Canadian, so that's no problem. I just put it into the F predicate. Now again, this looks a bit silly because it looks like I put all sorts of things into a single place predicate F, but you just need to convince yourself that all I've put in is a single individual thing because I only named one individual. We've already seen then that the bracket use for operations is pretty easy to use. Whenever there's an operation, always use brackets. Operations also just count as a singular term. Now the important thing to know and learn when you're dealing with operations is that you really need to learn how to read places or slots so you don't get confused in the translation of an operation. So here's an example. How many places is each predicate and how many places is each operation? Let's look at the first. G bracket A, B bracket C, D, close, close. So in order to try and figure this out, we can sort of go inside out or outside in. So here I notice that there's an operation B bracket C, D, close bracket. Now how do I know that it is, that is a single operation? It's because operations have a bracket that opens right after it, which means we should look for the close bracket itself. I also know then that A is just on its own. The reason why is because there's no bracket right after the A, so A is just a name letter. Similarly, C and D are also just name letters. So when I realize this, I can sort of figure out one at a time. 
it makes sense that A, C, and D are just names. They're single, they're zero place, actually, so we say uh, they're name letters, zero places. B, lowercase b, actually has two slots in it, occupied by C and D, because each of those is an individual name. So B is a two-place operation. Now finally, G, how many terms go in that? Well, remember, each completed operation is just a single term, so A is on its own, and the B operation is also on its own, so G has two places. What about F, A, bracket, B, bracket, C, close, close? Uh, well, we can sort of go outside in this time. Um, I'm looking at the A predicate, and I see that there's a bracket that opens. Then I see inside there's a B bracket, a B predicate with a bracket that opens, and so on. Now, the important sort of trick here is that it's easy to see that F itself is a single-place predicate. And the reason why is because single-place predicates do not have a bracket that open on its terms. So in the first example, G had brackets, uh, but F does not, and that's why we immediately know F is single-place. What about this big thing for H? Well, immediately I do know that H is more than one place because there are brackets, but really I just have to go one thing at a time. So here I'm going inside out, and it's quite easy to spot all the name letters or the zero places uh, because they don't have brackets that open up next to them. After I do that, it's straightforward to move backwards, and I see that A is one place, C is one place, E is two place, and it's easy to see that H actually has three slots in it occupied by three separate completed operations. The other important thing that we're missing from predicate logic is the identity sign, equality. And we're going to look at that now in combination with operations. Now identity is really just a special two-place relation. And you would think it sort of behaves in the exact same way, but unfortunately identity actually has its own syntax rules which sort of come from mathematics. So even though it's a two-place uh, predicate or two-place relation, we really need to treat it a bit special. Now the important thing is when we use equality, we actually write something on the left-hand side of the equal sign and the right-hand side. Notice we've never done that with predicates before. A predicate, a two-place predicate like L, always has L bracket XY, close bracket and we don't put something before and after, but identity we do. And the reason why is just because we're sort of used to it. So the proper way to write identity is we would say something like alpha equals beta. But remember, it's a predicate, so the things that go into the identity slots have to be subjects or terms. How do we say alpha doesn't equal beta? Well, we actually write it as the negation out front, just like we would write the negation of any predicate. So you might actually look at this and say, oh, negation alpha equals beta, isn't the negation just modifying the alpha? But it's not. It's actually modifying the equal sign. Sometimes this can get a bit confusing, so a lot of people just adopt the does not equal sign in the middle, and that is an acceptable use of uh, syntax in our symbolization scheme. Because the syntax for identity is a bit different, we often encounter quite common mistakes with it. Let's look at some. In this example, there's nothing wrong with the C bracket A bracket, there's also nothing wrong with the equals D. The problem is we've actually used brackets around an individual term, an individual subject, and we never do that. So it's the brackets around the entire left side that is causing the problem. So this is no good. Here we have AB equals Y. Nothing wrong with equals Y, but on the left side we have AB, which are two name letters, so I actually have two terms on the left and one term on the right. Identity is a two-place predicate where something equals something, and so I can't have two things on one side. That's no good. For f bracket x equals y, close bracket, x equals y is fine. The issue here is that I've actually put a predicate inside a predicate. Equality is a two-place predicate or relation, and we know that we can never nest predicates together, so that's no good. Here, f a equals b is also the same problem, because you might have actually thought that the problem with the previous example, f bracket x equals y, is actually the brackets. It's not. The problem is you can't have a predicate in a predicate. What about x equals g bracket a b? Well, it's the same issue here. g bracket a of b is a predicate itself, and you can't have that be one element of the equality. Here, bracket x equals a, close bracket, Actually, this looks pretty good. There's nothing wrong with x equals a, but the problem is the brackets around it. Now, you might think that there's no problem with the brackets around it because we're sort of used to seeing stuff like this in math, uh, but remember, we actually never put brackets around predicates at all. That would be like seeing bracket f a close bracket, and we never do that. 
We don't put brackets around singular predicates ever. We put them around binary connectives. We also have a equals not b. Now again, this doesn't seem so wrong. Intuitively, this does make sense, but this is actually, syntactically speaking, an incorrect way of using negation. We can't put any logical connectives inside a predicate ever. Only terms can go inside the predicate slots. So not b is no good. Finally, we have negation bracket x equals y. Again, this doesn't seem so problematic, but the issue here is that you can't have the brackets around the predicate of uh, identity because we never put brackets around uh, a single predicate ever. Okay, so let's look at an example now of an operation combined with identity. How do I say Tom's cousin isn't Jody's dog walker? This is nice and straightforward now given our new skills. To symbolize this, we just have to sort of go piece by piece. How do I say Tom's cousin? A bracket, E bracket. How do I say Jody's dog walker? C bracket, F close bracket. And then how do I say isn't? Well, isn't is just is not. So you can use the uh, does not equal sign, or you can say negation and then the equality. Again, don't be fooled by the second form. That's not saying not Tom's cousin. It's saying it's not the case that Tom's cousin is Jody's dog walker. And that's the right way to read it. So equalities and operations expand our ability to talk about things. Uh, equality seems like it's actually going to be quite precise, but actually that's the one that opens up a lot more doors for us. Using equality, we can actually symbolize all sorts of uh, complicated sentences which we use in our everyday English language quite regularly. And in particular, we can symbolize things that involve quantity as well. So in what follows, we're just going to be looking at some more complicated examples of English sentences and how we make use of equality to actually symbolize them properly. Frank and Carla cuddle different dogs. Now symbolizing Frank and Carla cuddled dogs is pretty straightforward, but the trick here is that the, we have the word different. So what does that mean? Well, one way that I could symbolize this is to say uh, Frank cuddled the dog and Carla cuddled the dog. And that's pretty much what I said here. Two separate sentences joined with a conjunction. Um, but there's a problem with this because the dog that Frank cuddled could be the same or could be different as the dog that Carla cuddled. I actually haven't specified at all in the logic. I just said they each cuddled some dog. Uh, so instead, I could say something like this. There is a dog and Frank cuddled it and Carla cuddled it. But of course, we can also see that this is no good. This is to say that Frank and Carla cuddled the exact same dog. Uh, and that's not what we mean. So how do I say Frank and Carla, Carla cuddled different dogs? Uh, well, I just have to pretty much say the first statement, that they each cuddled a dog, uh, and then I need to specify that the dog that Frank cuddled is not the same as the dog that Carla cuddled. And I do that with a very simple x does not equal y, or negation x equals y, right at the end. In this case, I've really specified that the dogs are different. One last thing that I want to point out about this example is that the x does not equal y at the end has to fall under the scope of there exists an x and there exists a y. Just because identity seems a bit different because of its syntax, it still needs to obey the standard predicate rules, which means that it has variables in its slots. Those variables need to be quantified. They need to be bound, or else we don't know what it is that we're talking about. So here, I have to keep the equality, or in this case, it does not equal, under the scope of all the quantifiers. How do I symbolize no singer except or besides Justin is awesome? I say except slash besides. Obviously, in a regular sentence, we would just pick one of them. I'm just trying to remind you that except or besides actually mean the same thing in this case. So if I symbolize this, again, it doesn't seem that uh, complicated now that I know how to integrate equality or does not equals into my symbolic sentences. So in the first symbolization, I've actually paraphrased a particular way. It says, it doesn't exist, uh, there doesn't exist something that's awesome, and is a singer, and is not Justin. Okay. In the second symbolization, I said, for anything that's awesome and, ju and a singer, that thing must be Justin. So that means no singer except besides Justin is awesome. And that's actually a very sort of like standard exclusionary clause. Now, a question that sort of pops up when I symbolize something like an exception, which is, am I missing something? Is there something from the actual English sentence that I haven't captured in my symbolization? Namely, am I missing the statement that Justin himself is also an awesome singer? 
do I need to just tack on at the end and A, A, and B, A? Now think about it. No singer except or besides Justin is awesome. Does that actually mean that Justin is an awesome singer? This is actually sort of like widely debated in classes typically, uh, but it's actually the difference between what we would call implication and sort of a more artistic term of implicature. Implication is actually what is sort of deductively uh, implied by the statement or the senten sentence itself. Whereas implicature is often things that we think are implied based off of context or sort of our own personal life experiences or just sort of like, well, everyone sort of knows that that's what it's meant. Um, but it, implicature is not very well defined in that sense. So you might think that it's sort of loosely implied that Justin is an awesome, is an awesome singer, in which case there's implicature. But it turns out that there's actually not direct implication that Justin is an awesome singer if I say no one except for Justin is an awesome singer. The reason why is because it's possible for me to say the contradictory statement without actually creating a contradiction. So here's an example. Suppose someone says no one but Fred is funny. You might think that that actually implies that Fred is funny, but consider this. If I say no one but Fred is funny and Fred's not even funny, have I actually made a contradiction? In fact, I haven't. If you think about that type of sentence, it's something that you've heard before. It's when people are actually trying to say in a fancy way, no one is funny. And that's actually perfectly compatible with my original claim. So what this shows is that there is no hard implication when I make an exclusionary case versus an implicature, which we think there is. And in logic, we only symbolize the implication. So should I have added that Justin is an amazing singer? No, I should not. We've actually seen the distinction between implicature and implication before, we just never made it explicit. Consider the statement, only philosophers are happy. Now we can just symbolize it going ahead any way we want, and we should come up with one of the two following forms. The first says, if you're happy, then you're a philosopher. And the second says, if you're not a philosopher, then you're not happy. But a question that we've never really asked before is, are there actually happy philosophers? If I say only philosophers are happy, it doesn't imply that there actually does exist a happy philosopher. Now if you look at the symbolization, you can see clearly that it does not. This statement can be true even if there are no such things as philosophers and no such things as happy people at all. And that's how come we actually use the universal to symbolize this. So when I make a universal claim about philosophers and being happy, I'm not actually implying any sort of existential claim about philosophers or happiness at all. But things get a bit weird when I use names. Consider the sentence, Rihanna is Drake's only friend. How would I symbolize this? Well, the, this, this type of symbolization is going to be more complicated because I'm using a multiplice predicate. But remember, we introduce everything first, and then I just sort of have to go straight to uh, the statement A is the friend of B. So I can symbolize it like follow. If I paraphrase as, if anyone is Drake's friend, it's Rihanna, I get something like, that looks like this. For anything, if that thing is a friend of Drake, then that thing is actually Rihanna. Okay. That makes sense, and this is how we can use equality to help us sort of symbolize more complicated statements using names. Um, but we still have the exact same question. Is Rihanna Drake's friend? And here the answer is actually different than in the philosopher example. It does actually seem that clearly implied by saying Rihanna is Drake's only friend is that Rihanna exists, Drake exists, and they're friends. Uh, and the reason why is because of the nature of names. Names implies that those things actually exist, unlike universal claims where we put them in the antecedent and they may not. So it turns out that this symbolization is actually incorrect. It's incomplete. So I can paraphrase this in different ways, but the trick is I need to add no matter what that Rihanna and Drake are actually friends. So in the end, I can say Rihanna is Drake's friend and no one else is. So that's F-A-D, and it's not the case that there is something, someone that is not Rihanna, who is Drake's friend. Or I can say, similar to my original symbolization, Rihanna is Drake's friend, and if anyone is Drake's friend, it's got to be Rihanna. Uh, so in the end, I get these two symbolizations, and there is a third option that is also equally correct, which is to invoke the biconditional. Now the biconditional here doesn't have as natural 
language understanding as the other ones, so I'm not going to stress about it too much, but you will often see this biconditional form in some other text or solution, so it's worth pointing out that that is a perfectly acceptable way to capture only in the use of names. So only with variables is still functions the same way. The complicated part is that when we move to names, the implication is actually different. We have to assert something positive about the name holders themselves. Here's an example of another type of sentence that we often use. The Prime Minister of Canada has the best hair. I put in brackets of people to be precise, but I'm not going to keep repeating that. So how do I symbolize the Prime Minister of Canada has the best hair? So the way to approach this is to sort of work inside out. And I go for the sort of big predicate that I'm trying to say. And the big predicate I'm trying to say is something about being better than. So I want to say that the Prime Minister of Canada's hair is better than something. What? Well, I'm going to actually have to say uh, of the hair of all people. So the Prime Minister of Canada's hair, that's just an operation. That's pretty straightforward. I plug that in to the first slot of my A, -A predicate. And now I can say something that looks like this. For any person, then, the Prime Minister of Canada's hair is better than that person's hair, which is to say that the Prime Minister of Canada has the best hair. But is this correct? It turns out it's not. There's a problem here. Can you spot it? The issue is that I've actually said that the Prime Minister of Canada has better hair than himself because the Prime Minister of Canada is also a person. And what I really needed to say is that the Prime Minister of Canada has better hair than any other person. Being better than is sort of an annoying relation because you uh, can't be better than yourself in a sort of odd way. So this type of sentence where I say the best or the fastest or the nicest or the smartest, etc., these are called superlatives. And superlatives, you sort of need to see, actually have a built-in exclusionary clause into it. Here, the hidden clause is to say that he has the best hair of anyone other than himself. So when we actually go ahead and symbolize this, uh, we can just symbolize it in a nice, simple way. The group, then, isn't just all people, it's all people other than the Prime Minister of Canada. So I can say, if you're a person other than the Prime Minister of Canada, then the Prime Minister of Canada has better hair than you, and I'm no longer contradicting myself in some weird way. And the symbolization of that is pretty straightforward. It's identical to what we had before, except I add into the group area, the antecedent, the exclusion that X does not equal B of A. The everyone we're talking about isn't the Prime Minister of Canada, and that's fine. Another way to symbolize this is to actually say there does not exist a person who has better hair than the Prime Minister of Canada. Here we're actually using a negation to twist things around. And when I actually symbolize it, this symbolization is really nice and straightforward. And what's interesting about this is because I do it this way, I actually don't need the exclusionary clause. Now, I wouldn't suggest that you actually memorize it one way or the other, because depending on the relation, better than or worse than, uh, you're actually going to actually need to put the negation in or the exclusionary clause in different contexts. So the best thing is to really remember that superlatives do make some sort of exclusionary statement, and you just need to spot it, identify it, paraphrase, and then symbolize straightforward way. Now, you might think that there is one last possible way to symbolize the Prime Minister of Canada has the best hair, which is to say, if you're a person, then the Prime Minister of Canada has better hair than you, as long as you're not the Prime Minister of Canada. And this type of symbolization would look like this. So this is actually very similar to the first one I did, except the exclusionary clause doesn't appear in the antecedent, it appears in the consequent. And this is actually sort of a common way of symbolizing because we speak like this quite often. But in fact, it's no good. This is wrong because we've actually contradicted ourselves in some odd way. We've said something about a group, about all members of the group, which is for all x, f, x, and then later we contradicted ourselves about that group. So this is not the right way. Now an easy way to see this is by this simpler example. How do I symbolize all sports are fun except for golf? Or a lot of the time people will say something like all sports except for golf are fun. Now notice I've sort of symbolized it, sorry, I've stated it in a way where the exclusionary clause is either in the middle or at the end, and this is sort of the natural way that we would say something like this. And in symbolizing, I have two options. Do I put the exclusionary clause in the consequent or the antecedent? 
But again, it turns out that if you put it in the consequent, that's actually saying something that's contradictory. I said, for anything that's a sport, it's fun, and it's not golf. And that just doesn't work. I really need to say, and the correct charitable interpretation of the sentence is to say, for any sports that are not golf, they are fun. And then I haven't contradicted myself. So remember, exclusionary clauses like this typically go in the antecedent because we're narrowing our group down and then applying the property to everything that we said. Equality is also the missing piece for symbolizing quantities. How do I symbolize Avery ate at least one carrot? Well, actually, there's nothing to this one. At least one is just the existential quantifier on its own. So I say there is at least one carrot, and Avery ate that carrot, and that means at least one. What about Avery ate at least two carrots? Well, in this case, I actually need to be a bit careful. I need to say that there is a carrot that Avery ate, let's call it X, and there's also a carrot that Avery ate, let's call it Y. But importantly, I have to specify that X doesn't equal Y, because if I don't specify that, it's perfectly possible that I just saw Avery eat the same carrot because I looked away and looked back. So this way, I'm actually very carefully specifying that there's, there's at least two carrots by saying uh, X doesn't equal Y. Now, if I want to invoke Avery ate at least three carrots, I just do the same thing, except I need to be a bit more careful about my does not equals. I say Avery ate the carrot X, Avery ate the carrot Y, Avery ate the carrot Z, but then I also say X isn't Y, X isn't Z, and finally I also need to say Y isn't Z. And if you just include all the proper uh, exclusionary click cases, you can get at least three, at least four, at least five, and so on. How do you symbolize Beth played at most one board game? This is actually a little trickier than the at least one cases, and it requires sort of an odd type of paraphrasing, which we'll actually try to extract from looking at the solution. So here is the solution for uh, the symbolization using universals. So in this case, what I'm really saying is, if there's a board game X that Beth plays, then also if there's a board game Y that Beth plays, it must then be the case that x equals y. So this is really just saying that if Beth is playing any types of board games, they all actually have to be the same, which is to say Beth played at most one board game. Now another way of understanding this could be about the existential and the negation. You could say, well if Beth played at most one board game, it's just not the case that she played at least two. And so here, at least two, is there exists an X, BX, so there is the X board game and the Y board game, Beth played them both, and they don't equal each other. So I can just say, at most one is equivalent to not at least two. Now there are two other forms of these types of symbolizations, which is where we pull all the quantifiers to the front. Again, I'm sort of going to mention this consistently throughout the video as a perfectly acceptable forms, but you won't see me do it. And in video three, I will explain why I avoid these types of forms in general. How do I symbolize this? Beth played at most two board games? Well, this is just a longer expansion, and it really just follows the exact same paraphrasing. I say, if X is a board game that Beth plays, then if Y is a board game that Beth plays, then if Z is a board game that Beth plays, it must be that there's really just two of them. So X is Y, or X is Z, or Y is Z. Now notice that this is perfectly compatible with there being all the same, or none at all. Beth played at most two board games does not imply that Beth actually plays a board game. Now the other way to symbolize this would be to pull all the quantifiers out. You could also use the negative existential, so you could say it's not the case that there's at least three, and so on. The last quantity that we're missing is how to say exactly cases, like exactly one, exactly two, or exactly three. We'll focus on exactly one, and we can sort of generalize outwards after that. So how do I symbolize Sarah ate exactly one piece of fried chicken? Uh, well, it's all about the paraphrase. So here's one paraphrase. Sarah ate a piece of fried chicken, and if she ate any other piece, it was actually the same as the first. That is a weird way of saying Sarah ate exactly one piece of fried chicken. Another way to paraphrase is to say Sarah ate a piece of fried chicken, and there does not exist a different piece of fried chicken that she also ate. Okay, we're going to symbolize both, and they're both nice and straightforward, but the trick always is to 
be able to arrive at the proper paraphrasing. So let's take the first one, Sarah a piece of fried chicken. Uh, here the symbolization of this is nice and easy. How do I say Sarah ate a piece of fried chicken? Well, I introduce the fried chicken and then I say Sarah ate it. Now I need to say and if she ate any other piece of fried chicken, so for all other for all things that are fried chicken, uh, then it was actually the same as the first. I just need to say x equals y because y is my other piece of fried chicken and it was actually x all along. It's like I looked away and looked back and it was actually the same one. Okay, so that's how I symbolize Sarah ate exactly one piece of fried chicken. Uh, again, I could rip out that universal quantifier to bring it to the front, and this is a form that you often see, but I'm not going to stress it in my videos. What about Sarah ate a piece of fried chicken and there does not exist a different piece of fried chicken that she also ate? Well, it starts off the exact same. I say that there is a piece of fried chicken X and Sarah ate it, and I say there doesn't exist a Y piece of fried chicken that Sarah ate that is different than X, and that captures the meaning of exactly one. We just did a lot of complicated sort of forms or models of types of phrases that you can say. And it turns out that the solutions are a bit long, so they're quite difficult to memorize, and I wouldn't actually suggest you do that. Really, the best way to understand how to symbolize all these different forms is to really be good at paraphrasing and understanding that you want to be paraphrasing in terms of conditional statements, conjunctions, and how to use equality. Equality really opens the door for us to symbolize things like uh, exclusionary cases, superlatives, quantities, and all sorts of things. Now, of course, you can also take this basic information and really build way more complicated sentences. So I can say Beth played at least two board games, and both those board games were pretty fun and enjoyed by everyone at the party. And suddenly I'm saying a really mega sentence. Now, the way to navigate through these is to just realize that I'm saying separate things. And so once I do that, I just put conjunctions everywhere, and then I just need to be careful. Think about how scope works, make sure the proper relations are under the scope, and work inside out.